Just like today, there was no shortage in the past of pranksters and hoaxers who gulled others with acts of deception, sometimes the aim was more or less innocent, intended for little more than getting a laugh, even if the perpetrator sometimes went to cruel lengths in order to get their kicks and giggle. Other times, things took a darker turn, following our 20 things about some of history's more creative and fascinating pranks and hoaxes. Number 20. Getting the Texas State Legislature to Bestow a Dubious Honor Throughout a long and productive life, Tom Moore garnered plenty of accolades as a Texas district attorney, compassionate lawyer and reformist legislator, while serving in the Texas House of Representatives. Moore grew annoyed with the numerous resolutions getting passed without anybody reading them. So he decided to have some fun with that. On April 1, 1971, Moore proposed a resolution to honor an esteemed American, Albert DeSalvo. It praised him for his dedication and devotion to his work. He has been officially recognized by the state of Massachusetts for his noted activities and unconventional techniques involving population control and applied psychology. The name of the honoree might ring a bell for some, after the was resolution passed by a unanimous vote, Moore let his colleagues know that they had just officially honored the Boston Strangler. Number 19. The Emperor Who Invented the Whoopee Cushion Roman Emperor Elagabalus, born 204 died 222, was declared ruler of the empire when he was barely 14, as might be expected, handing that kind of power to a teenager did not turn out well, while not as cruel as some of Rome's more monstrous rulers. He was no gratuitously cruel Caligula or Commodus, Elagabalus did display the occasional mean streak. That streak often showed in his practical jokes, which, considering that he was emperor with none above him, always meant punching down, at the milder end of Elagabalus pranking was his propensity for seating some of his more pompous dinner guests, on the ancient Roman version of whoopee cushions, that emitted farting noises when they parked their posterior. The crueler end of the spectrum, as seen below, was putting people in fear of their lives. Number 18. Waking up next to wild beasts. Whatever its downside, embarrassing people by seating them on whoopee cushions is a relatively harmless practical joke, redolent of innocent fun. Not so Elagabalus habit of pranking people by putting them in mortal fear of life and limb, one of his favorite pranks began with the teenaged emperor getting his dinner guests so drunk, that they had to crash and sleep it off in the palace. Once the marks were zonked out, Elagabalus had his servants sneak tamed lions, leopards, bears or a mix thereof into the bedroom. Come the morning, the emperor would bust a gut laughing at his hungover guest's reaction to waking up, in the midst of a menagerie of man-eating predators, between that and other behavior his subjects viewed as deviant. Romans heaved a sigh of relief when Elagabalus was violently overthrown at age 18, he was beheaded, his corpse was tossed into a river and his memory was damned by a senatorial edict. Number 17. The Renaissance's Most Creative Prankster Early in his career, Italian architect and designer Filippo Brunelleschi, born 1377 died 1446, rediscovered the principles of linear perspective once known to ancient Greek and Roman builders, but lost in the Middle Ages, he is considered the founding father of Renaissance architecture. And the first modern planner, engineer and sole construction supervisor, his major work is the Duomo in Florence, the dome of the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore. Brunelleschi's creativity was not limited to architecture, the man was also a prankster, who mastered the practical joke like few had before or since, his most famous prank targeted a cabinet maker named Minetto also known as Il Grosso or the Fat. Minetto was prosperous and good-natured, but he had the misfortune of ticking off Brunelleschi by missing a social gathering, so the pioneering architect got him with an epic prank, he screwed with Minetto's mind, and got him to believe that he'd switched bodies. Number 16. Convincing a Mark that he had magically switched bodies, Brunelleschi was known for thorough preparation and paying attention to detail in his career as an architect. He was equally thorough in pranking Minetto. First, he assembled a wide cast of characters, and coached them on what was needed to convince the mark that he had metamorphosed into somebody else, a well-known Florentine, named Matteo. Finally, one day in 1409 while Minetto was closing shop, Brunelleschi went to his house, picked the lock, entered and barred the door behind him, when the mark got home, he discovered that the door was barred from within, rattling the door. Minetto was alarmed to hear his own voice, actually Brunelleschi's, doing an impersonation, asking who it was. Upon identifying himself, he was accused of lying by the voice on the other side of the door who declared that he was Minetto. Number 15. Taking a prank to a higher level 
Brunelleschi's assertion that he was Minetto so confused his mark that he retreated to a nearby piazza. There he met an acquaintance, Donatello, who addressed him not by his given name but as Matteo. Then a bailiff passed by, addressed Minetto as Matteo and despite his protestations that he had the wrong man, promptly arrested the cabinet maker for debt. The now thoroughly bewildered Minetto was taken to prison, where his name was entered into the register as Matteo, thrown into lockup, his fellow prisoners, all of whom, also in on the prank, addressed him as Matteo, discombobulated, the cabinet maker spent a sleepless night in jail, befussing himself with the notion that it was all a case of mistaken identity, that would soon get cleared up, the following day, things got worse. Number 14. Messing with a Mark's Head After a night in jail, things got worse for Minetto's mental health when the morning brought two relatives, the real Matteo's brothers, to the prison who claimed him as their kin, they paid his debt and freed him, while berating him for his gambling and wastrel ways, more bewildered now than ever, Minetta was escorted to Matteo's home in the other side of Florence. There, the cabinet makers' protests that he was Minetto and not Matteo were dismissed with derision during that day and evening. He was nearly convinced that he had indeed morphed into somebody else. Eventually, Minetta was put to sleep with a potion supplied by Brunelleschi and carried unconscious back to his own home for the final chapter of the prank. Number 13 putting the final touches on the Renaissance's greatest prank. When Minetto came to the following day in his own home, he discovered that his house was in disarray, with furniture, tools and other items rearranged, his confusion grew with the arrival of Matteo's brothers, now addressing him by his real name. Minetto, they shared a fascinating story about the previous evening, when their sibling got it in his head that he was Minetto. The story was confirmed when Matteo arrived, and described a puzzling dream in which he had been Minetto, that nearly drove Minetto around the bend, as he became convinced, at least for a while, that he spent a couple of days morphed into Matteo eventually, when he discovered what had actually happened. Minetto felt so humiliated, that he left Florence and moved to Hungary. Number 12. A Hoax That Shaped History Perhaps no single hoax has had a greater impact in shaping history than the one perpetrated by now anonymous medieval monks, and known as the Donation of Constantine, the monks made up a document recording a generous gift from Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, transferring authority over Rome and the entire Western Roman Empire to Pope Sylvester I, reigned 314-315, and his successors. The text described how Sylvester I miraculously cured Constantine from leprosy, which convinced the emperor to convert to Christianity. The emperor showed his gratitude by making the pope supreme over all other bishops, and over all the churches of God in the whole earth, Vast landed estates throughout the Roman Empire are also granted, for the upkeep and maintenance of the churches of St. Paul and St. Peter. To top it off, the Pope and his successors were granted imperial regalia, a crown, the city of Rome and all of the Western Roman Empire. Number 11. The donation of Constantine transformed popes from mere priests to power players. Incredibly, people, including kings, popes, and emperors, eventually ended up believing in the donation of Constantine, and acted accordingly, the donation of such vast territories elevated the popes from mere priests and religious leaders to independent princes and sovereign rulers of territory in their own right. In reality, the donation was forged in the 8th century by some unknown monks, hundreds of years after both Constantine the Great and Sylvester are dead and buried. The forgery had little impact when it was concocted but centuries later, during a period of political upheavals that racked medieval Europe. The donation ended up playing a huge role in shaping Christendom and the West. Number 10. Dusting off and weaponizing the donation of Constantine The donation of Constantine was stashed away and forgotten for hundreds of years after its initial forgery. Then, in the mid-11th century, Pope Leo IX dusted it off, and cited it as evidence to assert his authority over secular rulers. Surprisingly, the donation was widely accepted as authentic, and almost nobody questioned the document's legitimacy. For centuries thereafter, the donation of Constantine carried significant weight whenever a pope pulled it out to figuratively wave in the face of secular rulers. Number 9. Exposing the Hoax It took the Renaissance and the spread of secular humanism to finally challenge the authenticity of the donation of Constantine, with a revival of classical scholarship and textual criticism. Scholars took a fresh look at the document, it quickly became clear that the text could not have dated to the days of Constantine the Great and Pope Sylvester I, 
One hint was the use of words and terms that did not exist in the 4th century, when the document was supposedly written, but that only came into use hundreds of years later. Additionally, the document contained dating errors that a person writing at the time could not possibly have made. The popes did not officially renounce the document, but from the mid-15th century onwards, they stopped bringing up and referring to the donation of Constantine in their papal bulls and pronouncements. Number 8. A prank that wreaked havoc with archaeology. In 1912, an amateur English archaeologist named Charles Dawson announced the discovery of human-like fossils in Piltdown, East Sussex, in a Pleistocene gravel bed, Dawson had found fossilized fragments of a cranium, jawbone and other bones. Britain's premier paleontologist pronounced the fossils evidence of a hitherto unknown proto-human species, they were also deemed the missing link between ape and man, supporting the then still controversial theory that man descended from apes. The pronouncements were accepted uncritically by many leading British scientists, further excavations in the vicinity were made in 1913 and 1914, during which stone tools were discovered two miles away, teeth and additional skull fragments were unearthed, so were animal remains and a mysterious carved bone resembling a cricket bat, the excitement mounted with each new find. Number 7. The toxic mix that fueled Britain's greatest scientific hoax. At the time of the Piltdown discovery, there was a growing, and as it ultimately turned out correct, scientific belief that human evolution from ape to man had occurred in Africa, it was there that fossils of Homo erectus, an early hominid, had been discovered, that however meant that the cradle of mankind was in Africa, and that all humans were of African origin, the notion that they were ultimately African was too jarring for many Europeans, including many in the British scientific community. The day's prevalent racism and ethno-nationalism buttressed British scientists' confirmation bias, causing them to interpret the Piltdown evidence in the light most favorable to their pre-existing prejudices, Piltdown man offered a feasible alternative, and thus a convenient out, from the challenge posed to the era's racist theories by humanity's African origins. So leading British scientists embraced the discovery and defended it against all critics. Number 6. The European Missing Link If the Piltdown man discovery in England was accurate, it would mean that Britain had played a prominent role in human evolution. The missing link between man and ape would have occurred in Europe not Africa that would buttress the belief that Europeans or at least the British had evolved separately and were not of African origins thus, the racist assumption that Europeans were a distinct and superior branch of the human tree could continue unchallenged. In actuality the Piltdown discovery was a crude hoax however, because of a combination of ineptness and ethno-nationalism and racism. The discovery was strongly embraced and defended by much of the British scientific establishment, it took four decades before Piltdown Man was debunked making it one of history's most successful scientific hoaxes, it was also one of history's more damaging hoaxes. During those decades, few resources were directed at studying human evolution in Africa, where the actual missing links were ultimately discovered. Number 5. The Belated Debunking of Piltdown Man Despite the poor funding for African archaeological exploration, more proto-humans were discovered in Africa in the 1930s, those finds, coupled with additional Neanderthal finds, left Piltdown Man as an odd outlier in human evolution, nonetheless. The hoax had its powerful defenders, and it was not until the 1950s that the fossils were subjected to rigorous scientific examination. They turned out to be fragments of a modern human skull, only 600 years old, the jaw and teeth of an orangutan and the tooth of a chimpanzee. Chemical testing showed that the bones had been stained to make them look older, and the ape teeth filed down to look more human-like, as to the perpetrator. He was a disgruntled museum employee getting back at his boss, Britain's chief paleontologist who had denied him a pay raise. Number 4. Inventing a Stone Age Tribe NBC Nightly News announced an amazing discovery on July 16, 1971. The outside world, after maybe a thousand years, has discovered a small tribe of people living in a remote jungle in the Philippines. Until now, the outside world didn't know they existed and they didn't know the outside world existed. Their way of living is approximately that of the Stone Age. Known as the Tassidae, the tribe's discovery was announced by Manuel Elizalde, head of the Filipino government agency in charge of protecting cultural minorities, and a crony of dictator Ferdinand Marcos. According to Elizalde, he discovered the Tassidae after receiving a tip from a local hunter about encounters, with primitive tribesmen deep in the jungles of Mindanao, tracking down the tip. Elizalde was astonished to discover that the tribe had been isolated for over a thousand years, with no contact with the outside world. Number 3. 
the peaceful Tassidae have no words for weapons, hostility, or war. As Elizalde described the Tassidae, they didn't realize there was a country, they didn't realize there was a sea beyond Mindanao, they did not even know what rice was, they were also complete pacifists. They have no words for weapons, hostility or war, overnight the Tassidae went from unknown to globally famous. Their pictures appeared on magazine covers, including National Geographic and clips of the tribe were featured on news programs, numerous documentaries were made about the Stone Age primitives and a best-selling book, The Gentle Tassidae was written about them, celebrities flocked to visit and be photographed with them. Number 2. It was all a huge hoax. When professional anthropologists sought to the study the Tassidae, they and their region were abruptly declared off-limits by Filipino dictator Ferdinand Marcos, it was only after his overthrow in 1986 that the truth came out, and it was revealed that the whole thing had been a huge hoax. Once journalists and anthropologists gained access to the Tassidae, they discovered that, far from being primitive stone agers, they lived like modern people, not in caves but in houses. They did not run around naked and barefoot but wore shirts, jeans, flip-flops and shoes. Investigations revealed that Elizalde had pressured the Tassidae into pretending to be stone age primitives, as to Elizalde. He had set up a charitable foundation which raised millions of dollars to protect the Tassidae, their way of life, and their jungle habitat from encroachment by the outside world. In 1983, he fled the Philippines, absconding with millions from the foundation. Number 1. The Petrified Giant Prank In October of 1869, laborers were digging a well behind the barn of William C. Stubb Newell, in Cardiff, New York, when they struck stone about three feet down, Clearing the soil around the obstruction revealed a huge foot, with mounting excitement, they continued digging, and were astonished when they finally unearthed the petrified remains of a ten-foot-tall man. As news of the find spread, hundreds of archaeologists and scientists and thousands of the curious flocked to Newell's farm, where he charged visitors 50 cents for a look. Newell made no claims about the giant's authenticity, but invited visitors to draw their own conclusions, while it seemed to many to be a crude statue. Many more saw it as proof of the Bible's assertions that giants had once walked the earth. The skeptics were right, it was all a prank. 